Would you please get your Bibles and would you turn to the very end of Luke? It's going to come up on the screen, but if you need time to find it, we're also going to jump to Acts. It's very frustrating for me that the Lord gave me Luke and Acts today because, of course, those are Pentecost passages, and now it means I'm going to have to think of something else for Pentecost, but it's the the passages that the Lord gave me for this morning, so here we go. Very end of Luke, chapter 24, starting at verse 49, I'm going to send you what my Father has promised. But stay in the city until you've been clothed with power from on high. When he led them out to the vicinity of Bethany, he lifted up his hands and blessed them. While he was blessing them, he left them and was taken up into heaven. Then they worshipped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy, and they stayed continually at the temple praising God. Acts 2, verse 1. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Thank you, Jesus, for your word. Um, Familiar passage. Apply brakes. Keep your hands inside the cabin. My old vicar always used to say, um, vision leaks. Vision leaks. You know, it's easy to forget or lose focus or divert by even one degree. And before you realize it, a couple of years down the line, you've ended up in completely the wrong destination. So each year at the start of the year, we return to our vision statement to explore again its origin, its meaning, its dynamics, and its focus. And as always the case with a vision series, it just comes with a massive invitation to get involved. I have a dream here that everyone serves, everyone prays, everyone gives. It's not, you know, pressure. There's no pressure. You don't have to. It's just an invitation. It's just a big, fat invitation, guilt-free. But whether you're new here, as there are many of you, I'm excited by that, uh, or you've been coming for years, the invitation is to get involved. And I think I'm going to talk probably more about that next week, but who knows? Um, If you've been here a while, you might have noticed that I'm not the sort of a guy who believes that the Christian life is like a holiday on a cruise ship where you get to enjoy an all-you-can-eat sermon buffet and cruise around on an ocean of spiritual consumerism just to return to the port that you set out from, slightly bloated, two stone heavier, and having made us some contribution to the world of zero. (laughs) I'm not just not that guy. I happen to be the sort of person who believes that the Christian life is a remarkable journey of personal transformation and power overflowing into the world made possible through intimacy with the Father, the blood of Christ, and the indwelling presence of His Holy Spirit. Come on. Feeling it. Love feeling it. Love feeling it. Benji and Emmy, as wasn't the case for many, uh, returned to school last week, and I, I was asking Emmy, how was, um, how was your, you know, your first few days back, and you know, she's happy with how things went, she quite likes her teacher, and um, you know, happy with her classmates, and I said to her, um, who, uh, who do you sit beside? And she said, James. I said, oh, you like James, don't you? He's a nice kid, he's a Christian, isn't he? And she goes, she goes like this, she goes, yeah, Dad, <laughs> not as full on as you. <laughs> 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 My poor kids. But I can't help it. You know, we've been called to a life that honors what Jesus has done on the cross. We've been called to a life that that calls spiritual orphans to a father who perfectly loves them. We've been called to a life that genuinely is meant to manifest the stunning realities of heaven to a broken world. I mean, I'm, I'm hooked. I can't help it. Of course, I'm full on. That's why I'm so passionate about our vision here at church. Because I believe that that's the life that God is calling us to through it. That we would learn what it means to live a lifestyle in which intimate communion with the perfect Father through His Son in the presence of the Spirit causes us actually to overflow with His supernatural goodness, power, and love into a world that He's longing to be returned to such a state that would be befitting for the return of its King. 
don't know why that landed so heavy for me this week when the Lord gave me that. It could be because we're watching uh, the Rings of Power on Amazon. It's all very Lord of the Ringsy, isn't it? So let's look at it again. I think we've got a slide. Here is our vision statement for St. Philip's. To pursue God until heaven overflows through us. To pursue God until heaven overflows through us. Um, for those of you who've been with us for less than a year, I'm just going to recap on the origin of that statement before I kind of launch into exploring it a little bit um, now and over the next couple of weeks. So forgive me if you've heard this before, but a few weeks after I arrived at St. Philip's, for those of you who were here, you might remember that I said hi and bye, got on a plane and headed to a conference at Bethel Church in California where um, I had a remarkable encounter with Jesus. During a time of worship, I felt the Lord manifest in front of me, and he reached into my chest, he grabbed my heart, and he pulled my heart towards him, and I felt in the physical my heart press against my ribcage. Incredible moment. And I knew it was him because he had turned the fullness of his attention to me, and as I felt my heart press against my ribs, he said, pursue God until heaven overflows through us. And I knew that he'd just given me the new vision statement for St. Philip's. And I remember thinking, well, how am I going to share that? I've only been here a couple of weeks. <laughs> anyway, it was a journey. But since that moment, I have given my life to those seven words, pursue God until heaven overflows through us. And as I said, we had a, an evening on Thursday evening with the worship team, and I, I said to them, and I want to say it again this morning, you know, I am just so grateful for how you guys have welcomed over the last three years your admittedly slightly full-on vicar, and how you have kind of grabbed this vision with me and how we're running with it together. I'm just, I'm so grateful to you. The encounter with Jesus in California was life-changing. I knew Jesus was in California. And that's where he is. It's the weather. <laughs> but it, it was life-changing. And, and the, the burden that God seems to have placed on my life, if I'm just being honest, is it, he has put this burden on me that I would encourage you to shape your life around that statement. It's a, I can't, I've not been in the gig that long. I find it, it's a weird thing, leading stuff. Because ultimately, your relationship with Jesus is your own business, and yet there's this thing that God's put on my life and I can't put it down. And, and maybe that's the way it's meant to be. You know, maybe, maybe when he calls people to leadership, he places something on our hearts uh, that starts a fire that eventually consumes every other ambition and desire and thought. Not as a pride project, but as a fire to see God's people walk in wholeness, empowered to bless others and glorify Jesus. I mean, I... It keeps me up and, and in the, at night and it wakes me up in the morning to pursue God until heaven overflows through us. I, I believe that um, our vision has called us back to first love. It's like it's a plumb line or a true north or an anchor that holds us to the truth that this whole thing is, is literally all about him. It's a relationship. It's a love affair. I want to be um, obviously clear that the vision statement is deeply missional. You know, it's, it's geared towards the overflow, to healing, to victory in the spiritual realm, to authority and declarations and the advance of the kingdom, and to revival and awakening and the salvation of many. But it's not calling us to start there. It's calling us to start with him. Sounds basic, doesn't it? to start with first love, to start with deepest communion. It's an awakening to worship. It's a deepening revelation of the word. It's a hungering in the spirit and a quickening of desire. It's a response to the Father's pleasure. It's a revelation of sonship. It's a coming home and a welcome into the everlasting arms. It's a preoccupation with the true nature of God and the true nature of heaven. And as we have turned over these last few years to the, the fullness of our attention and the fullness of our affection and devotion, we've been learning 
to value and dwell in his presence. We've been learning that heaven lands on adoration, that the Spirit manifests where he's honored, that it's the Lord who builds his church, that love is the highway in the kingdom, spiritual authority comes to those who pursue humility, that spiritual maturity is not measured by how much you know or by your age, but by how much time you have spent in the presence. And that the dynamic of overflow is hardwired into the normal Christian life. That's the vision. And uh, today, I just want to make two observations quickly from our readings about what it means to pursue God. It's a funny phrase, our statement, isn't it? To pursue God until heaven overflows through us. I got lots of feedback when I first announced it, which all basically was summed up by the question, what does that mean? Well, it means that the Christian life is not passive, It's a relationship, which means that it's active. It's an invitation and a response, a drawing near, a longing, a loving, a learning, a deepening, a discovering, an imparting, a becoming. There's a mutual knowledge of one another, a familiarity, a precious communion. There's fullness and fruitfulness, testimony and witness. You know, relationships don't belong in books And they don't belong in theories or theologies. Relationships belong in being fully present to each other. Oh, thank you for that. I love a good Christian. Mm. (laughs) It's better than an email on Monday morning saying that was a great preach. Just give me a mmm any day. Fully present to each other. That's why I say there is nothing more valuable than the presence of God, the actual presence of God. I mean it. There is nothing of greater value to me, I want it to be for you, I'm sure it is, than the actual presence of God. Because there's nothing more valuable than actually Him. Theology, doctrine, it's all great, but it's Him. It's all about Him, who He actually is actually learning to hang out with him. The book is important, crucial, beautiful, foundational. I am in love with it, but he doesn't just want us to know the book. Come on, he wants us to know him. The pursuit is all about a deepening communion. So two observations from our readings in Luke and Acts today, which mark this moment when God's people are filled with his presence and his power. And the aim, just as I explore this stuff, is just, it's just to think about what it means to pursue God until heaven overflows to us, but specifically why the pursuit must be our starting point and our priority. Are you up for that? Good? Excellent. Crack on. I will. All right. The first observation is that power flows from the presence. It doesn't come from anywhere else. Which means that without the presence of God, there's no power to be had. Power comes only from the presence. And it's very clear biblically that God means for his people to be supernaturally powerful. In Luke, the parting words of Jesus, his last recorded words on earth according to Luke's account, is that they needed to be clothed with power before they did anything. No kingdom work. No ministry in the model of Jesus, no healing, no evangelism, no uh, preaching to the four corners of the earth, no proclamations of forgiveness and redemption and the advance of the kingdom, no prophecy, no church growth, no looking after widows and orphans. Nothing was to be attempted or undertaken without power. In the Bible. (laughs) Note the point Jesus is making. He's not saying that there is nothing to do without power. He's saying don't do anything without power. Totally different thing. We all know that it's perfectly possible to do lots of stuff without power. Christians seem to do it all the time, have done for centuries. Keep me humble, Father. But when God's people, oh, over a period of time, take their eyes off the power, they are left with nothing but the gifts they have in the flesh. Paul warns about it in Galatians. Why are you continuing in the flesh? What started in the spirit? 
And then you get churches talking about wanting to involve everybody's gifts without reference to the power of the Spirit. When you don't have power to heal or prophesy, you have to fall back on the practical gifts you have, like good with numbers and great with kids and creative, good at painting. Refurb the toilets, you're great at painting. You want to use everyone's gifts. That's why I always say to our leaders, our preachers, our home group leaders, whoever it is doing anything in this church, I am more interested in your anointing than I am with your gifting. I don't care if you don't know how to structure a good sermon and preach to time. All I care is that you are dripping with the oil of anointing that has come from spending time in the secret place with the presence of God. There's always a danger that God's people take their eyes off the presence and they look to the works, not to the wonder. They fall off the pursuit. They forget that it begins with him, not what we do for him. We pursue him in order to overflow. Hardwired to our task is the truth that the flesh carries no power, but the presence of God through us carries the whole power of heaven. So in Luke chapter 24, the primary focus that Jesus wants the disciples to have on the day of his leaving them is to orientate themselves to power because he wants them to be clothed with it. It's the only way the church will fulfill its mandate to bring heaven to earth. So that's what happens at Pentecost. The presence of God enters the room. They're clothed with the promised power, the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Power flows from the presence. And Acts 2 describes this moment when the presence of God rushes into a room. It says this, Suddenly there came from heaven, note the origin is heaven, a noise like a violent rushing wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. I love this. I read this. The word for rushing is Pharaoh. It's used 67 times in the New Testament. Only once is it translated as rushing, this account here. The other 66 times it is translated as to carry, to bring forth, or to bear. I had no time to work out or read or study why it's translated differently in, in, the, in the Pentecost account, but I think there has to be something significant about the sense of bringing forth the power of God. Out of heaven, the Holy Spirit bears to them the power of God. Something is carried forth from its place of origin and released and brought to bear on the earth. At the moment that the church is birthed, the presence of God fills his people and they're empowered to bring heaven to earth. why we must be a people who pursue the presence because power flows only from the presence you won't get it anywhere else you won't get it from your learning you'll only get it from the actual presence of God according to the Bible second observation the pursuit flows from posture power flows from presence pursuit flows from posture it's all the P's today people The sign of an anointed sermon, as you know, is alliteration. According to Luke and Acts, the Christian life is meant to be characterized by a dynamic of pursuit. Jesus says to the disciples, wait in the city until you are clothed with power. Everyone say, wait. Wait. What does it mean to wait? Waiting is a posture. It's a decision that impacts our stance towards God. It's an active posture, which really means it's about the heart, because the heart is the seat of our desire. So waiting is a posture of the heart to desire him. We often use the phrase, uh, let's wait on the Lord. You know, you might have a friend advise you during a difficult time in your life, you just need to wait on the Lord a bit more. Or when a vicar moves into a time of ministry, quite often it'll be, you know, let's wait on the Lord for a bit. And it sounds like a passive dynamic. It's actually far from it. It's an active, intentional dynamic full of anticipation and expectation. What do the disciples do in our readings today? Luke 24, 52 says their immediate instinct was to worship. The very next verse, it says they go straight to the temple and they continue to worship. In other words, they're waiting is about pressing in. They press in in that time of waiting. They pursue the presence. They go after God. They position themselves for what has been promised. They posture themselves for encounter. And then 
by the time we get to the day of Pentecost, they're united and they're all in one place. And verse 14 of Acts 1, which we didn't read, says that they're all praying constantly together. Worship, prayer, gathering, pressing in. It's an active waiting. I love this. The Hebraic concept for waiting on the Lord, like that used in Psalm 37, apparently, actually, literally means to lie in wait. Like setting up an ambush. It's a turning of the fullness of my attention to the Lord because I'm about to encounter the presence and power of God and I don't want to miss it. It's a chasing down in order to get your quarry, to put yourself in a position where you know that the thing that, is, that you're chasing is going to pass you by. And you've chosen an advantageous spot that you know will best position you to encounter the thing that you're pursuing. Everything about your focus is on what's going to happen. You ever played hide and seek or, you know, those games as a kid? I used to jump out at my sister. Don't have time for this story. One of my favorite moments in my whole childhood was the day that I went into my sister's bedroom and crawled under her bed. And I waited. And I waited. And you know how hard it is to wait. I mean, as an adult, but as a kid, when something cool is about to happen, and you're waiting. And I waited. I so nearly gave up. But I kept waiting. And then she entered the room. And this is the best bit, I feel. Still, I waited. She moved around. She sat at her desk. She folded some clothes. I think I waited another 10 minutes. And then when she got close enough, I just grabbed both her ankles. Bah! She screamed. Mom, I didn't do anything. Best moment of my childhood. can tell you the twitchiness, right, of waiting, the moment, the ambush. Everything about your focus is on what's going to happen. Every sinew is strained. Your eyes are alert. They're wide open. Your ears are listening. Your muscles are just twitching to capture the thing that you desire, to terrify your sister or encounter God's power. <laughs> Another translation of this concept of waiting in, in the Hebraic concept, because you know it's multi-layered, the language. It means to twist, twirl, or spring forward. I love that. It's what it means to wait on the Lord. The whole point of lying in wait is to discover where God is and to encounter the fullness of his presence. I've heard it said, and I have to say I've come to agree, that it is arrogance to say, well, if God wants me to have it, he knows where I am. You have to be more than open. You have to pursue him because he wants those who want him. It's a dynamic that I have grown up with in the church to go where God is, to lie in wait and to ambush him for what he's got for you, to seek him out and position yourself so that you can receive the blessing of the Spirit. In 94... I talk about it all the time because it was a season that changed my life. Sorry, there are other churches if you're sick of it. And, um, you know, in that season when God was pouring out his power and his presence in incredible ways in Toronto, every single night, revival prayer meetings for 12 years, every single night for 12 years, the power of God being poured out. People got on planes and just headed to Toronto. Loads of my friends in London got on planes and flew to Toronto because they wanted to be where the presence of God was. And I have learned to do that. I've done it myself. That's what I was doing when I went to Bethel when I first came here. I got on a plane to put such value on his presence that it would be costly to buy a plane ticket and get on a plane and travel across the world to hang out in his presence for four days, and on day two, I had an encounter with him that changed my life forever. Don't have to have the money to buy a plane ticket. I've got three sermons to write in two days over the next little while. One of those days is Friday of this coming week. But I got a message, 
And I'm the sort of guy who needs time blocked out, otherwise stuffed. And usually between 9 and 12. After that, it's lunch. I can't think after lunch. And I can't do the evenings. Too tired. Very, very narrow window when these servants come out. I'm going to ditch my Friday because I heard that Chuck Parry's in Bristol on Friday at Bristol Healing Rooms. Chuck Parry co-leads the healing rooms at Bethel. Thousands of people get healed every year there. I met him three times, sat beside him at lunch once. This man carries such a sense of the presence of God. It's like, it's like all you want to be is a sponge when you're around him. First time I ever saw him, he came to my last church, and we were all worshiping at a staff meeting, and he was like this. I'd never seen someone worship like that before. I said to my friend, what's with him? And my friend just said, his love tank is full. Um, where was I going with that? Yeah, so I'm taking time out. I'm going to go and sit in the presence. Like I said, I don't want to be him, but I want the mantle he carries. If there's a crumb for me, I'll sit at that guy's feet because he's dedicated his whole life to sitting in the presence of God and healing people. Incredible. I'm going to posture myself on Friday to lie in wait. So waiting on the Lord, it's, it's anything but passive cruising until God might do something in your life. It's positioning yourself to encounter the promise that he made, that you'd be clothed in power. So what they're doing in Acts 2 is they worship, gather, and pray. They're lying in wait. They're posturing their hearts to expectancy, permanent orientation to the presence of God. And the thing is that, according to the Bible, when you do that, what happens is you get your and suddenly moment. And the presence of power of God is pharaohed from heaven to earth into you so that it can flow through you. Power flows from the presence. The pursuit flows from posture. Nearly done. You might have noticed the frames on the way in, the porch. Did you see those? I love them. Their contents are trying to articulate aspects of the vision and culture here that we long to grow in. One of them quotes David in Psalm 27, One thing I ask of the Lord, this only do I seek, that I may dwell in the presence of the Lord all the days of... Dwell in the presence of... <laughs> One thing I ask of the Lord. This only do I seek. That I may dwell in the presence of the Lord all the days of my life. To gaze upon him and his beauty, and his majesty, and his burning eyes of love, and his scars, and his grace, and his affection, and his pleasure, and his humility, and his obedience, his majesty. I'm gone. I'm gone. I don't care. I'm gone. The pursuit of God's presence was the posture of David's life. Everything he did was in the context of a lifestyle of going after God, and I mean it was a lifestyle. It was an outrageous love affair that no one understood, and that caused offense to many. But it caused heaven to land on his kingdom and the favor of God to rest on him as a person. The pursuit of the presence of God is where it begins. It is not an activity to add to your list in this church. Nor does it actually flow from a church vision statement. It doesn't even begin in church. It begins and it flows from the personal posture of your own heart to hunger for him, to desire him, to love him, to long for him, to sing embarrassing songs to him, to dance before him with your curtains closed and no one's looking, to dig into the word and ask the Father to ignite it, to set it on fire, to watch the pages burn with the affection of Jesus. It's that personal decision just to cultivate humility, hunger, desire, and faith. It begins with you. You know, Acts 1 lists the people who are gathered in the upper room. I love it. You want to read these names and honor each one of them. Peter, John, James, Andrew, Philip, Thomas, Mary, Jesus' his mother, his brothers, and all the women, all the women, the whole lot of them, all gathered, 
all of them understanding what it means to arrest your life in the pursuit of the presence of God, to make that the central focus of what you do with your life. And they all walked in remarkable power and influence. They changed the world. Their posture was to pursue. Their pursuit caused the presence of God to manifest. And the presence of God conveyed the power of God to change the world through them. Amen.